Hello and welcome to the KE Report. Chad and Corey here today introducing a new company on the show, Encore Energy. Traded on the TSXV under the ticker EU and also traded on the NASDAQ markets in the U.S. under the ticker EU. We are chatting today with Executive Chairman William Sheriff, and Encore Energy is a producing uranium company operating in the United States, at present mostly out of the South Texas assets. The operating Rosita mine went into production the end of last year in November, and the plans from the company are to bring the Alta Mesa mine and production center into production later this year in 2024. The company also has a full stable of development stage assets and a lot of pounds in the ground in Texas, in Wyoming, South Dakota, and also in New Mexico. We'll get into some of that as we go, but first of all, Bill, why don't you start us off big picture with how this company came together, what the strategy is for production growth in 2024, and an overall big picture view of how Encore Energy fits into the uranium sector for investors listening in. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chef. Appreciate you having me. First off, Encore has been around for a long time, and it's come out of a long legacy. I'm uh, starting back in 04 uh, when uh, Paul Matusik and I started an f- uh, original company, Energy Metals Corp. Very successful run during the previous uranium uh, market, sold out to Uranium One in 07, 08. Went on the board for a year or two, then left uh, just in time for uh, Fukushima and started Encore about that time. Fortunately, we were able to fund ourselves, picked up some projects uh, with some long-term value, and uh, basically waited patiently until 2019 when we saw some sea changes coming in the uranium market. 2020, we acquired two of the only 11 existing operable plants in the United States for in-situ production. And then subsequently, uh, last January in 2023, we picked up the third. So we currently own three of the four fully licensed plants in Texas and three of only 11 in the United States. We are 100% devoted to in situ recovery. We aren't really a mining company. We aren't regulated by mining authorities. You won't see any big yellow trucks or open pits or undergrounds uh, operations, uh, no tailings. Everything we do is through drill holes and moving fluids, drill holes, water, plumbing, and pumps. So uh, we're uh, much more akin to the oil and gas industry in that regard. Bill, let's talk big picture about the production profile of the company. You just started production back in November at the Rosita Central ISR uranium production processing plant. Right now, where does the company stand in terms of production? And give us a couple of your timeline, too, of some of your guidance. Thanks, Corey. Appreciate it. First off, our uh, overriding goal is we're staying entirely in the U.S. We're the uh, you know world's biggest consumer and, and virtually no production other than ourselves and a, another uh, small ISR company is producing. And uh uh, this year, being a startup in 23, or actually for 23, we only got about a month of production in, so it won't be much. But 24, uh, you know, we'll be looking to uh, bring in Alta Mesa by mid-year, and combining the two, we'll be north of 500,000 pounds for this year. And, uh, you know, that's going to ramp up steadily. Our three-year goal is to be at a production rate at the end of three years of 3 million pounds per annum, such that the fourth year would be 3 million pounds of production or more. And all of that's out of South Texas. We do have a five-year plan of going to a five million pound a year mark. And that uh, would see us bringing in our Gas Hills and our Dewey project, which uh, Gas Hills is in Wyoming and Dewey is uh, straddling the border between Wyoming and South Dakota. Well, Bill, I was going to ask you about that because you do have that production profile that can expand as you move into Wyoming and South Dakota. But with so much of the focus on Texas, Let's just maybe narrow in for investors on what the year ahead looks like, other key milestones that you want people to focus on. Obviously, Alta Mesa coming into production is the big one, but what other things should investors have on their radar for the strategy this year? I think the big one uh, all centers around Alta Mesa. You know, we picked that up, as I say, in January of 23. Uh, we announced a joint venture for 30% sale of, of that uh, at a 70 plus percent markup from what we paid literally months before. And that'll see Boss Uranium coming in, a major Australian company coming in as our junior joint venture partner. Uh, they're putting $70 million into the company. And uh, we're debt-free as of this morning with uh, a few million bucks in the bank at the moment. So that when that closes here uh, before the end of the month, we'll have $70 million bucks in, in the bank, no debt, and uh, uh, proceeds coming in off the Rosita sales. Uh, shortly after that, we'll see the uh, production grow with the Alta Mesa. 
So those are two major factors. But following that close of the Alta Mesa transaction, you want to really be seeing how quickly we advance the number of drill rigs at Alta Mesa, as well as the number of projects we're drilling on. The reason that we sold the 30% in Alta Mesa was to get funding to move all of our projects in our pipeline of projects forward in terms of time. We've been very aggressive on M&A, and we view this transaction as a, as a kin to an M&A transaction. The uh, quantum, the 70 million, will allow us to take our entire uh, production plan and accelerate it so that we'll be able to produce more pounds sooner. So that's what you want to look for the rest of this year is. Obviously, the production at Alta Mesa, the closing of the boss deal, and then uh, you'll see progress on a number of our other fronts, especially the satellite projects in Texas that will move to feed uh, and increase the production output of Rosita. When do those satellite projects come into play? Can you give us a bit more background on number of satellite projects and how they would filter in, when they would filter into production? Well, currently, we have four or five of them listed on our chart and our deck, and uh, most important of those are Upper Spring Creek. And uh, there we have two different projects on opposite sides of the highway, basically, Brown and Brevard. And uh, we were going to start working on uh, one of those uh, towards the end of this year, first part of 25. With that extra money, we're able to accelerate that. We'll be working heavily on it now. And I think you'll start seeing a meaningful increase in the production in 25. We obviously aren't far enough along in terms of that work to be able to give that a quantifying impact. But it'll certainly uh, impact the Rosita production sometime during 25. And of course, Alta Mesa is going to be just a steady ramp up to its uh, design capacity of uh, 2 million pounds on the back end per year. Well, Bill, just for people listening, a lot of people, when they think about uranium, think about Canada and the Athabasca Basin, or maybe they think about Namibia, some Aussie production. But when you think about U.S. production and in situ production, just break down for listeners the advantages of doing pumps and fluids versus traditional hard rock mining? Well, the advantages are, are many. First off, 60% of the world's uranium is produced through uh, ISR or in situ. The bulk of that's in Kazakhstan where they use acid. So uh, one big difference in the U.S., uh, we don't use acid. The only thing we put in the ground is uh, oxygen and a small amount of baking soda. So that, that starts off with permitting. You go into your permitting agency. We aren't putting a mine in. We aren't having dumps. We aren't having tailings. Uh, we're drilling holes. The only thing we're putting, we're pumping groundwater out, putting oxygen in it, sending it back into the ground, dissolving uranium, pumping it to the surface, running it through a, essentially an industrial water treatment plant, uh, ion exchange. And uh, that recovers the uranium. We refortify the water with oxygen, rinse and repeat. Over the course of a couple of years, the well field becomes depleted and you move on to your next well field. So it's very, very friendly in terms of permitting on the front end because we aren't putting anything hazardous into the ground and we aren't leaving any lasting scars. And uh, as for reclamation, uh, the process is uh, really relatively straightforward. And I'll you know, leave some of the details out, but certainly it, it basically consists of turning off the oxygen, continuing to circulate the groundwater for a couple of years, and uh, then you're, you're pretty close to uh, being able to walk away from it. And once you've walked away from it, you're done. And you, you look at that very quick timeline to permitting. Obviously, in Texas and Wyoming, we have huge permitting advantages, which I can go into if you'd like, but significantly faster than anywhere else in the U.S. and most places in the world. And uh, you, know, you, you don't have much objection to the process. It's a very efficient, well-established process. And then on the cleanup, it's, it's equally quick and efficient. So... Uh, that's how the in situ industry in the U.S. with uh, a grade, uh, you know, that pales by comparison to Athabasca can compete efficiently and uh, really come in there at the same uh, price per pound as, as most of the high grade mines. Bill, can we also talk about the company's sales strategy for the uranium that you're producing? Because, look, uranium has been on a great ride higher, but there is that debate of just how much higher will uranium go and look, uranium companies can forward sell some of their products. So how do you go about managing a volatile uranium price while you're in production? Well, I guess the first thing to realize is the spot market is an indicator of what things are doing. Very, very few transactions uh, actually occur in the spot market, either historically or even recently. I view it akin to sticking your finger up and telling which way the wind's blowing. You can't tell how hard it's blowing or how long it's going to blow, but you know which direction. The vast majority is contract driven. Our philosophy is to do most of our business through contracts that have a spot component. And by that, typically what we'll do is we'll target a, a consumer electric utility in the U.S. And 
do a three or four year contract with them to provide a set amount. And they'll have a floor and a ceiling or collars, price collars, if you will. And that way we, we're going in and making sure that we've got a base level of income and that we're going to uh, be profitable moving forward and yet expose ourselves to a significant amount of the potential gain on the spot market without risking the illiquidity of the spot market. You know, everyone's been a bit spoiled over the last uh, couple of years with a, a, you know, essentially a straight up market with very few uh, minor setbacks. But at some point you will, for whatever reason, in any market, get pullbacks and, and even short term corrections. And when those come, the volume of the spot buyers was going to be very akin to uh, the bids in an illiquid stock. That is to say, they're going to dry up real quick on the way down. And uh, they've done this time and time again in the uranium market. And uh, this won't be a lot different. The one thing that is different now is we're in a demand pull market. Uh, there's huge increases in demand forecasted against a pretty static supply. And that's the first time we've seen that literally since Three Mile Island in 1979. So... This is really the dawning of a new opportunity, first time in 44 years. And uh, that's going to see prices continue to go up, but they aren't going to go straight up. So I would uh, caution the listener to, to not expect that straight up movement. And uh, selling entirely into the spot market, you're, you're, you're a risky strategy. And uh, you know some days there may not be a buyer there or a buyer at the price you want to sell. So we prefer a much more blended approach whereby we are contracted with take or pay counterparties. So we know we're going to get the income, and yet they are open-ended enough to where not only do we get the uh, ceiling price, we also get that adjusted on an annual inflation basis, so it goes up every year. So that, that's the uh, strategy for uh, the company, and we've got about 3.6 million pounds currently contracted out over uh, the next five years, which still leaves us some, some room, for sure. Well, Bill, I was also going to ask you about that as far as the upside it's nice that you have the almost defensive strategy there of knowing you're going to have a buyer for the pounds in the ground and that you've got a little bit of pricing flexibility to capture some of the price movements if it does go up. But you also alluded to over time, bigger picture here, that you are going to be able to bring in some of the production up in Wyoming and in uh, South Dakota. Could you maybe speak to how that would add to the production profile just for a big term look at it? Yeah, I mean, we like I say, in, in the sixth year, we're, our goal is to hit 5 million pounds a year production. And uh, obviously, at that rate, we'll be contracting a heck of a lot more than we are now. Here again, the contracting won't be at, at a fixed price or even a es uh, base case escalated. Uh, we'll be looking to, to do these collars that uh, uh, have substantial upside exposure and you're signing floors that are in the context of the uh, general term market to begin with. And uh, you know, we'll be far more active. We don't want to contract 100% of our supplies because or of our projected projection for a number of reasons. Number one, it's not prudent. It doesn't allow you uh, that extra bang in the spot market. But the, the second part is, is if you get any sort of production delay, you're, you're, you're kind of over a fence and forced to go into the market and buy and deliver at lower prices, which is not a, not a good success for longevity. So, Bill, we've covered the production that is ongoing and going to be growing in South Texas. The company also has projects in other states in the U.S. Do you want to quickly highlight any of the growth plans for any of these assets, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, like, like I say, our initial three million uh, pound a year targets solely in Texas within a hundred mile radius of Corpus Christi, which gives us great efficiency. Perfect place to build a business and a base. Once we've established that, you know, in, in 26 or uh, about that time frame, we'll be looking to expand into Wyoming with uh, Gas Hills and then uh, also into the uh, Dewey project. Each of those is about a million pound a year project. Uh, the growth potential on both of those, but as they stand now, that's where we are. And then ultimately, the company's got a big uh, store chest of value in New Mexico. We own 468 square miles of uh, mineral rights that cost us nothing to maintain. We've got uh, in all categories, including uh, historic from you know major oil companies back in the day, you know, over 70 million pounds in there, and uh, at least 32 of that's uh, 43101 compliant. But the problem is, is New Mexico is not particularly business friendly, whereas Texas and Wyoming are both not only business friendly, but agreement states. And that is that you don't deal with the federal government. You don't deal with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because they have, as the name implies, agreed with the state governments to have the state enforce the federal laws. And so it basically gives you one window permitting that you don't get in the other states. So New Mexico, while it has a huge storehouse of value for us, we view it as probably a six or seven year time frame before it really kicks in. Five if uh, the stars align. 
But the, the chief issue there is, is you have an Aboriginal or an Indigenous uh, community uh, that's an extremely large uh, impact in the state, but also the uranium industry is an extremely large impact on them as well. And it's not always treated them particularly well. So you're going to have to have some very creative approaches to dealing with the Navajo and, and other associated tribes in the area. And you're going to have to uh, essentially go hand in hand with them to the roundhouse in Santa Fe or the legislature in Santa Fe before you ever even dream of getting a state permit. And so we've been busy working on that. We've got a good track history of it. One knows that Uranium One, we dealt with the black empowerment issues and, and very successfully so uh, by in, introducing, a, in essence, a sweat equity uh, format for ownership in the, in the endeavors. And you know, we've, other members of the team have had its other similar successes. So we think we're at the leading edge of that. And uh, you know, fortunately, we have our hands full for the next five or six years in uh, Texas and Wyoming. And uh, But we do look to go into New Mexico ultimately. The other thing I might mention is we've been very active over the last, well, as long as I've been in the business with M&A. And we fully subscribe to the oil patch adage that it's cheaper to buy reserves than find them. And so I think even though the number of players on the playing field is diminished somewhat, you're going to still see a considerable M&A activity in the sector. And that's something that we'll obviously be a part of. Well, Bill, I think this would be a great point to just speak to the pedigree of the management team and board of directors you have as the executive chair assembled here. Uh, talk to us about your background in the business, but also some of the key people on the team. Sure. I, I got started myself. I've got a couple of geology degrees and also did my time in the uh, financial industry as a market maker and had a couple of brokerage firms and that sort of thing. But I got started in uranium in 1986 when I purchased the Union Carbide Worldwide Database. Since then, we've accumulated probably a half a dozen to a dozen similarly large databases, which are uh, really like treasure boxes in terms of uh, U.S. in particular, but worldwide uranium deposits that were found so successfully in the 70s before the, the industry uh, uh, kind of fell on hard times. So great value in that. The company owns a number of those as well, in addition to the ones I do. So that's, that's a big plus. When we uh, revamped the company in 2019 and saw the sea change coming, we put out a, a search worldwide search for our CEO, and we were very fortunate to attract Paul Gorenson, who's built the last, I think, three or four, maybe five of these plants and has put more well fields in than he has fingers and toes. So a uh, really experienced individual. In fact, he built Alta Mesa for a private ranch back in 04, and uh, now we own it again. So um, re really familiar territory. In addition, Dr. Stover, uh, Dennis Stover, he was our previous uh, CEO, and he's uh, our chief technical officer now. He's one of the co-inventors of the in-situ process. We've got a couple other board members uh, with 40 years experience in the business, uh, most of that in in-situ. And uh, then we've got a board uh, member, uh, Susan Hoxiki, who's actually a nuclear fuel buyer and uh, a nuclear physicist that uh, helped design the fuel rods for Southern Company's Vodal reactors, which are... The most recent ones to come online, Vodal 3 coming online in 23 and Vodal 4 scheduled for later this year. So first ones in 20 years in the U.S. So we've got a really strong board of technical expertise. And with Paul's experience and having been president of Cameco Resources and worked for um, Rio Algum and BHP, his ability to attract talented, experienced staff is really second to none. And we've got experienced operators all the way from uh, supervisors in the field through managers all the way up to the board enough to run two plants easily. So we're uh, more than blessed with uh, with our staff and that's our strongest asset. Let's talk about share structure as well then. Simply from the aspect of key shareholders, any analyst coverage since you are listed on the NASDAQ, I know that you do carry some decent volume there in the US. So take us through some of the key shareholders, any analyst coverage as well, please. Sure, the bulk of our shares trade in the U.S. probably four times the average in, in Canada, although we maintain a pretty healthy uh, rate of transaction in Canada as well. We have Cantor Fitzgerald, uh, Haywood, PI, and Canaccord, of course, that are that are covering us. A couple of others, B. Riley is just initiated so in the States. So uh, about a half a dozen or so that are actually covering us with research. Uh, in terms of funds, we are probably... 60% institutionally held. Of course, this changes as, as days progress, but certainly that and, and ETFs are a big factor, obviously, that, that wasn't here last go round in the 04 to 07 run, but ETFs are a big part of it. And uh, then retail, uh, retail, actually, we haven't uh, got that big of an exposure to, you know, we probably got maybe 10% of our holdings. And, uh, but the bulk of it's ETF and institutional, and then a, a pretty good 
representation of high net worth individuals as well. Well, Bill, one more point we wanted to make about the company in this initial introduction here is the investment your team has made into technology. And so just another iron in the fire is that you have this technology called Group 11 Technologies and another one for assaying called Prompt Vision Neutron PFN. Could you just speak to how your team has been on the cutting edge of technology? Sure. And I'll take the latter first. Prompt Vision Neutron is something we use every day. It uh, cuts down on the number of blank drill holes we do. It gives us instantaneous uh, uranium assays as soon as the hole's drilled and we drop the... Uh, typically, you drill a hole and you drop a gamma probe, which tells you if there's any gamma radiation, which is associated with uranium, but uranium does not emit gamma radiation. So it's an indirect means of approximating, and, and generally pretty accurate, approximating your uranium, but it's not a totally a accurate because uranium tends to be in solution and tends to move or migrate within the underground formations. So by having the PFN or prompt fission neutron, we actually have a, a neutron emitting source that goes down, excites the uh, uranium atoms, and we get a direct reading of exactly how much uranium is there right then on the spot, which obviously has uh, big, big ramifications in terms of where the next drilling goes when we stop drilling in one direction, go in another, et cetera. So it's, it's a real key advantage for us, and uh, we do have the uh, you know, patented rights to that. On a uh, longer term, more developmental issue, we're about a 30% holder in a private company, Group 11. And Dr. Stover is involved with this here again, one of the two inventors of the uh, in situ process. And this looks simply at using benign chemistry to try in situ on other commodities. Uh, take, uh, for instance, gold and silver. Uh, obviously, there's some being done in copper, so we aren't looking at that. But we're also looking at those deposits of uranium, which are typically not leachable. Uh, you have to have redistributed uranium. That is, once it's in place, it has to have been dissolved by Mother Nature and then move forward on a roll front in order to be uh, considered leachable under or recoverable under in situ recovery methods. And uh, what Group 11 is uh, just now starting to look at is taking some of those uranium deposits that heretofore have not been considered leachable or recoverable and figuring out a, way, a new way to try and attack those as well. So, you know, it's uh, a longer term view, but uh, any breakthroughs there could be uh, revolutionary. Well, Bill, we'll wrap it up here for today, but it's a nice introduction into the company Encore Energy, some of the production profile in place for this year and the years to come, some of the growth in the company. A strong team, a good balance sheet, no debt as of today, and also uh, investing in the future with technology and innovation, something we hope to see more of in the resource sector. So for those that are following along, if you have any questions for Bill, please email either Corey and I. We'll get those answered and click on the link below this interview if you'd like more information on the company. It'll take you over to the company news section. And Bill, looking forward to our next conversation. Absolutely. Uh, appreciate it, Chad. Appreciate it, Corey. And I look forward to further discussions.